Howdy and welcome to Geologic Disasters. While you see this magnificent canyon in Zion National Park, I need you to think about what kind of geologic disasters could occur here, because they do and have. In fact, there's a lot of clues when you look at rocks and you see landscapes that there can be risk and hazards. Some may be more obvious than others. You look at these steep slopes and you're going to say, oh yeah, there'll be rock falls. Well, what about rock slides and what about uh, massive flooding that could occur in a canyon like this? They are super important when you're traveling and looking at these types of situations. So I would encourage you to start looking at the clues and rocks that could tell you, hey, these might be a place that could be dangerous and then keep your eyes and ears open. In today's world, lots of people like to put earbuds in and don't listen when they're outdoors. And it's important to listen for a number of reasons. We're gonna be covering multiple types of what I would call important geologic hazards. These are not the only hazards that can occur, but they're the primary ones and they're the ones that often make news and they should for a reason. So we're gonna start with earthquakes. Earthquakes occur every single day. The question is, do very large ones occur? So what is the definition of a large earthquake? Well, that depends. It depends on several factors. First, you need to think about what type of population and where the people might live. For example, the photo you're seeing here is from Pakistan. This was a 2023 earthquake and a lot of the structures were not made to withstand earthquake uh, types of L and R waves, which we'll get to here in just a minute. Certainly not at a magnitude, which is the intensity of shaking, not the damage. So I want to be very clear that when you hear things like Richter, Richter is kind of antiquated, but it's still something that we can all use as a reference point. But it's important to note that Richter scale, while it measures magnitude, can't give us a true picture after about six and a half on its scale. And it's a logarithmic scale. So when we start getting up into that point, Usually the intensity gets much larger than 10 times the value from one number to the next on the scale, like from zero to one, one to two, two to three, three to four, five to six, six to seven. So when you reach that six and a half, seven point on a magnitude scale, we use a second magnitude scale called moment magnitude. And truthfully, your intensity gets literally about 30 times the intensity than it does 10 times the intensity. So it's no longer just a logarithmic scale, it's bigger than that. So what's an earthquake? We get some kind of rupture inside the earth. Now, I often get a question, well, can you get what's called a focus at the surface? On a rare circumstance, you can. So usually that's gonna be faults that are near the surface or at the surface and exposed at the surface. For example, the San Andreas Fault in California. So earthquakes, the rupture occurs and typically you get either an up or down movement or sideways movement. Sometimes you get both, which obviously could yield even worse results, especially if the rupture point is fairly shallow. What do I mean by that? So when we have an earthquake, seismic waves, that's the name of, of earthquake waves, they go out in all directions throughout the earth from that rupture point. And so the closer that rupture point is, which is known as the focus, to the Earth's surface, the shorter the distance of travel, so the intensity of the magnitude of those earthquake waves doesn't dissipate as fast. So a good demonstration of this would be you chunk a rock into a river or a lake and see the ripple marks are really close to the impact of where you threw that rock into the water. And then the wave length between one wave to the next gets further and further apart, those ripples do, because the intensity dissipates until you can no longer see the ripple marks. So you have to imagine that on a much grandier scale with earthquakes. So these two terms, epicenter and focus, are worthy to talk about here. Whenever you hear about an earthquake, people want to say, oh, well, the epicenter, well, that's, that's an important place, but the most important part of an earthquake is the focus. So let's talk about both 
and why the epicenter is different from the focus. The focus is the rupture point inside the earth. Like I said, you have a rare circumstance at a surface type exposed fault, then you would see possibly a focus that's within just a few feet or right at the surface. You know, less than a kilometer is what you'll usually see on the United States Geological Survey USGS earthquake webpage. And so the epicenter, if I have a focus here and here's the surface, the epicenter is directly above where that earthquake occurred. The last distant subsurface from the top of the earth, meaning where people are, where the land is, the closer that rupture point is to the surface and the higher the magnitude typically yields higher damage and worse impacts to humans. And you might wonder wh why, and I think I just answered that a minute ago with the intensity of less time to travel for those earthquake waves. I will tell you though, not every earthquake is the same. So there's a number of factors you have to consider. What's the ground material that's being impacted during an earthquake during shaking? That's one. Number two, how long does it shake for? What type of earthquake waves? Do you have earthquake waves that move more to left and right that are surface earthquake waves? Or do you have more, oh, what I like to call the roly-poly, which are R waves or Raleigh waves that make more of a up and down motion like this? If you have both, <laughs> that could be really bad. But let's just take a situation where we have an earthquake that is an 8.5 magnitude, which is extremely high. That's called a great earthquake. And so a great earthquake occurs and we have it under New York City. Then we have one in the middle of Death Valley National Park. You have to ask yourself which one's going to cause more damage. How many structures are there? How many humans are there? What's the population density? What are the buildings and structures made of? What is the subsurface made of? And you, and obviously there would be a higher potential for damage in New York City. Let's take that same earthquake and put it in a real earthquake prone place like San Francisco, for example, or Japan, where many of the structures are built with uh, engineering in order to shake a little bit up and down and sideways because they're in earthquake prone areas. But you take that same earthquake that I just mentioned, a great earthquake, that eight point something, and you put it in the middle of, let's say Morocco, where you could have buildings that just come right down or Haiti or Pakistan. So it depends on where you are and what the structures are made of what the ground material is, the intensity of shaking, the duration of shaking, and the length of rupture. All of those things matter, and I left out one important factor. Are you near a water source? Because if an impact happened, like say in the ocean, and you're on a coastal area, that could mean a tsunami. And typically tsunami warnings can start with earthquakes that are about six to six and a half and bigger than magnitude. So something to think about. So when we think about earthquake hazards, you need to know that there's four different types of waves. There's two big groups. There's body waves. Those are waves that are traveling through the Earth's interior. And then you have those that travel out or along the surface of the Earth, and those are called surface waves. There are two types in both categories. So there are two body waves. There's P is in primary and S is in secondary waves. P waves are always the first to arrive on the scene. So if you look at this seismograph station, you'll see the initial shaking right in here, okay? That's your initial P wave, and P waves produce more of a jolt. And then you're gonna see there's an interval of time between P and S. So earthquake waves move at a certain velocity on average when there are body waves like P and S. L and R waves don't typically have the same travel time that are easy to predict because of the types of material geologically you may be traveling through. For example, you got very loose sands or beaches or flood deposits. Earthquake waves will behave differently in that than they would if you were traveling through a very dense rock like granite. 
So once your S wave arrives, you can see there's a top and a bottom to your earthquake waves. And then the distance between two waves obviously would be your wavelength. And this is your wave height. The tallest impact, meaning the tallest magnitude, tells us the amplitude that is. So that's going to tell us the intensity of shaking. And that will be plugged into a model that will tell us its actual magnitude on what you would recognize as a Richter scale, but it's really moment magnitude if you're above that six and a half. So shaking from surface waves are different. So remember P waves are the jolt, S waves kind of move side to side inside the earth. Well, we have the same situation that happens with surface waves and that L and R waves, they're called love waves and Raleigh waves. L waves move side to side like the shimmy. So if you can imagine a building swaying left and right, moving side to side or a highway, that could be absolutely devastating. Then you got the R waves that move like you're shaking a carpet or doing a wave at a football game. Well, that's gonna cause structures to bounce up and down. Some buildings and some roads can withstand a certain amount of that up and down before they collapse. Obviously, if you get enough of it in a long enough period of time and the buildings aren't built for that it, and the duration of shaking, that could impact how an R wave could create of a series of R waves, wreck some really big havoc. But it's L waves, love waves, that cause the absolute worst damage because they can actually knock something off their foundation. They can literally disconnect the sections of a highway, railroad, so forth. So we care about all four types of waves. We really care about PNS waves because it helps us triangulate the location of the epicenter of an earthquake and it tells us the first initial types of waves and the intensity of the, the S waves, but the L and R waves, if they occur in an earthquake, are the ones we're most worried about for damage. So there's some hazards associated with earthquakes. While they may seem obvious, I'm going to cover them because I feel like they're not so obvious to people. I think most folks know that landslides can occur during earthquakes, but they can also occur outside of earthquake situations. You take a look at this and you see, oh my goodness. Okay, so a big landslide's covered a highway. Bad news if you were in that highway or that's your highway that you used to get to work or to the grocery store. You're just out of luck right there. When you have rapid shaking of the ground, take a look at the substrate and notice that even though we have some vegetation coverage on these really steep hills, you can see that they've been uh, eroded and lots of weathering has occurred. They are subject to failure when there's some type of shaking from an earthquake. So during a seismic event, this type of situation is going to be un unfortunate. So if there's a township, a village, a city there, those people would be buried their homes, hopefully not in them, but if they are, and oftentimes that's what happens because earthquakes are unexpected. And you might be thinking, well, how can we predict earthquakes? We can predict areas that are prone to earthquakes based on measuring with seismographs, seismograph stations, by looking at uh, slopes and following the history of an area geologically. And there's a few other types of indicators that an earthquake could occur. For example, along the San Andreas Fault, there was stress applied over time as it was being stretched laterally, and things like fences and roads began to be displaced, moving sideways, and eventually that rupture point happened. That's what an earthquake is. It's like you're holding something and you're just, oh man, it's pulling or sliding or moving apart, and then one day it just does that. It slips apart. In this action right here where the ground is trying to find equilibrium until it stops, that's what creates aftershocks. And then the settling of those rocks in that land afterwards is what aftershocks are. Liquefaction is another scary part of earthquakes, one that if you're in an, in an area that has this problem, you would be familiar with. Otherwise, most 
general public doesn't really hear about liquefaction until there's some kind of monster earthquake that creates this phenomena. Typically what we have is ground failure because groundwater or water enriched soil is shaken so fast during an earthquake of usually higher magnitudes that it basically causes the molecules like the clay molecules and other types of sediments to lose their cohesion with one another. So basically they become slippery. And what happens is it turns into mush. So that mush is what call, we call liquefaction. And that liquefaction is absolutely awful because especially if you get a lot of L waves moving stuff side to side, that liquefaction is going to create a situation where buildings and structures can literally just topple right over as you see right here. There's something called lateral spreads, another thing that the general public doesn't hear about, but if you're in an area that's subject to uh, weathering in the first place and erosion and then you get an earthquake along some gent more gentle slopes as opposed to something that's really steep where you might see a landslide or a rock slide, you'll get something called a lateral spread where the ground literally just pulls apart because of the shaking. And that's what you see in this diagram here. This can wreak havoc on any kind of human structure, whether it be a highway or a house, a neighborhood, a shopping complex. So lateral spreads are another earthquake hazard. Ground subsidence is another example. This can happen when you have a situation where large areas of land can literally fall during an earthquake. Even if you have an earthquake where land is shoved upwards, land can actually sink after the earthquake or during the earthquake along a fault line like you see here. So look at the left picture and you see the ground just collapsed inside of itself, almost like a sinkhole. On the right though, let's take a look at what's happened here after the 2004 Sumatran tsunami. You see this area right here where in Indonesia, you had a house actually sink and now it's below sea level. So it's subsided in, in permanently in the ocean. So that's a bad situation long-term. So once the shaking stops and all these unconsolidated settlements settle out, the ground can actually fail. It can happen during the earthquake and certainly after the earthquake. Sometimes we don't think about fires being an imminent problem for an earthquake, but let's take one of the most famous earthquakes that created a fire situation, and that was the 1906 Great Quake in San Francisco. So an 8.3 earthquake struck in magnitude San Francisco along the San Andreas Fault, moved the land sideways about 20-ish feet, a little more than 20 feet. And the shaking lasted for about 45 seconds to a minute. That doesn't sound like long, but it's, it's quite a bit of length of time. And when you start getting into your larger magnitude earthquakes, the longer they shake, the more potential they have for destruction tsunami wave productions, things of that nature. Well, what happened here, you think back and scroll the clock to 1906, when shaking occurred, these buildings also predominantly were not made of fireproof material and they began to burn and they burned and the fires killed a number of people. And so besides just the earthquake and all the building failure, the ground failure, the fires can pose an imminent threat to human health and the environment during an earthquake, larger, especially earthquakes. When you get earthquakes that produce a tsunami, so you're looking at a tsunami that was created in 2011. I was on my honeymoon, so I can remember this. I was, I got, we got married and we went on this cruise and we were on the cruise ship. We had just finished the midnight buffet. We're headed back to our cabin and saw in real time, not news coverage of after the fact, but it was happening in real time. The earthquake had produced a tsunami and it was so large. This was what's called a rare great earthquake, which is 9.0 or higher on magnitude scales. And this earthquake in Japan wrecked total havoc on the coastline and wiped out some communities completely. And we saw that tsunami actually hit land and watched the devastation and people trying to get to safety. 
it was profound experience to see that because you saw people who were literally running for their lives. Some made it, some didn't. But tsunami waves happen because displacement of the water, this can happen in a lake too, but more commonly in an ocean, but two, several ways we can get a tsunami. But in an earthquake, what happens typically is you either get, uh, you have what's called a, a dip slip fault where there's been movement down or up. And the actually worst type of tsunamis is where the seafloor rises up and scoots sideways. That's called a mega thrust earthquake. But it can happen with what we call a normal fault where the ground slips down. But the displacement of water sends waves upward towards the surface. And those waves, you need to think about this, tsunami waves involve the entire profile of ocean water, not just the top of it like a wind generated wave. So as these tsunamis are traveling in the wide open ocean, they're just a couple of feet tall, but their wavelengths are hun several hundred thousand feet long. So they're kilometers long. As they approach shallower continental shelf, as you're coming in to the shorelines, that acts almost like a speed bump or a giant hill. And it slows that wave down, which causes these waves that are moving at jetliner speeds, the front end of them to kind of push upward like this, and the top of it's moving slower. You still got hundreds of kilometers fast behind it, and it's pushing that wall of water towards the shoreline. And there is nothing stopping that tsunami. So a misnomer that people sometimes have is that there's only one wave in a tsunami event. Typically, there's multiple waves. There's no set prescribed amount of waves that, can, that will happen for each earthquake. A lot of it's contingent on the length of shaking and the length of rupture point along a fault zone. But tsunamis, not only do they wipe everything as they come in and they're carrying all this debris, they also come back out and go back out to the ocean. Both are absolutely devastating and the damage created by tsunamis is sometimes the most expensive and life-threatening of an earthquake. So we talked about how these tsunamis form. I also want to address that we can get tsunamis from volcanic eruptions where we get some kind of a major landslide or a caldera collapse. We can also get them from where an asteroid or meteorite smashes into the ocean or a lake and creates displacement of water. So you can get it from some kind of mass wasting where you get big rocks that fall in or something that falls in, an impact crater, and then certainly with an earthquake. But this goes back to talking about why tsunamis are so dangerous. So when you see a tsunami in the deep ocean, you're literally looking at something that is tons over 10 kilometers, miles long. <laughs> and then you get the speed of jetliners. And as it's coming into the shoreline, you can see how the profile changes where you're just getting this massive wave height. And while it's still a mile or two long, you're going to see that intensity of all that water. And remember, it's the whole profile of water, not just the top of it. So you got the entire depth of that water moving up to a couple hundred miles per hour. And so it's not just a little small wave. These are massive destructive geologic hazards. So we can see extensive flooding, obviously, but the wave impacts the erosion to shoreline. You get these really high impact, fast moving, mile per hour currents, and then everything they pick up. So anything it touches, that can be stuff that's hazardous, that can be wiping out uh, sewage facilities, electrical plants, medical facilities, then you start to think about trash and everything that's in there. It just, it can be a really devastating thing. If anything is impacted in terms of life, that material is also in there. So you can end up getting disease and water. So this is one of the biggest hazards of tsunami is the floating debris and the actual water and the flooding. This was from the 2004 Sumatran tsunami. This is actually in Thailand, which is a long distance away, but that's the point is tsunami waves can travel an entire ocean basin. And the 2004 uh, Sumatran tsunami was just one example of that. We had the largest earthquake recorded in human history since we got a magnitude scales developed in 1960. And that occurred in Chile in South America 
creating tsunami waves all throughout the Pacific Ocean Basin, impacting Hawaii, Japan, Alaska. So lots of these big earthquakes create these kinds of wrecks of havoc. And what's dangerous about you seeing these people out here is that there could be more waves coming. So this was actually photographs taken from the 2004 Sumatran tsunami, and this is exactly what occurred. There's some video footage out there you can find online showing people going to look at the damage and then another wave comes in and this happened repetitively through that process. You start to see the power of water and this is after the tsunami and earthquake and you begin to see these are not things that you can win with. In other words, higher ground is always the best answer out of the path of a tsunami. This is Banda Achi, uh, which is the most impacted place in the 2004 tsunami from Sumatra. This is in Indonesia, and the top part of the peninsula you see there was before, the day before. And I might add that the earthquake occurred the day after Christmas. So you're looking at an image right around Christmas at the top picture, and then the day after is the 26th. And so of Christmas. And so this is what a satellite image looked like after that tsunami came through. So you can imagine any people that were living there or animals, they didn't stand a chance. And literally there was no warning system, which is one of the things we'll talk about in a minute, which is why we have ways to mitigate things like earthquake hazards. One way is through monitoring. And there's two agencies that predominantly do this, the USGS, and then NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The reason NOAA is involved is they kind of do the, what we call the DART system, which are the ocean buoys that have been set up that actually have a seismograph station and they work in conjunction with USGS. And so there's a seismograph station on the ocean floor and there's these buoys that are at the surface and they're connected with a chain. And then there's a satellite relay that sends the information to a satellite, then puts it out to all the monitoring stations around the world. So warnings can be issued for tsunamis. So these two federal agencies, not just in terms of tsunamis, but their seismograph stations at the United States Geological Survey has set up globally for that matter, but predominantly in the US. So when you take a look at the USGS, this is just an example of one day snapshot from their earthquake webpage where you can actually see that they have a way to monitor where earthquakes occur. And so the larger the circle, the bigger the earthquake and the colors mean something like red means within the last hour, yellow means something, orange means something. There's a, a legend that you can look at. So the warning systems that are put in place for earthquake hazards are numerous, which is so important because we do have the DART system, which is the Deep Ocean and Assessment and Reporting of Tsunamis. One of the monitoring stations is actually located in Hilo, Hawaii. I've been there and that's one of the most tsunami prone areas in the world uh, in conjunction with probably Japan, Indonesia, Alaska. So there's different headquarters for these places. And again, they're linked, these DART systems are linked with a satellite, so things are quickly relayed. And so some of the things that happen in a tsunami warning is we're looking for not just ground shaking at the bottom of the ocean floor or displacement, we're looking for a sudden rush of movement of those jetliner speed waves that may just be really short at the surface, but remember that whole profile of water from the bottom of the ocean floor to the surface is being measured. So we're looking for that. All of those things we're looking for in terms of a rapid change. When we mitigate earthquake hazards, one of the things that we want to do is also recognize where we could have these problems. So when you're looking at this, this is the, actually where the different DART stations are set up. You can see the yellow ones have recent data orange ones, which there's not really any showing right now, just have historical data, and the red ones have no data within the last eight hours. So when you start getting lots and lots of 
new stop, those are going to be your red ones. And you can see this one actually shows where some hurricanes were forming in the Atlantic. So there's a pattern to where these earthquake dart systems are set up for tsunamis. So let's look at that because there's a major subduction zone right here where Juan de Fuca is subducting under the North American plate. This is the big ocean plate called the Pacific plate. This is where the Pacific plate is subducting under North America and Eurasia. This is Hawaii and some other uh, dart areas put along this major fault zone right here. These are the ones along the other parts of the ring of fire or the Pacific plate. But let's take a look at these. These are the ones in the Atlantic. You're like, well, I didn't think we had problems with tsunamis in the Atlantic. We could if Puerto Rico or some of these other areas that are along uh, subduction zones have a situation much like we had in Indonesia. Same result. And what's really scary is the Gulf of Mexico has a very, very flat continental shelf, which means the impacts of a tsunami would be astronomically devastating. So let's take a look at the Indian Ocean Basin. So you're looking out here. There used not to be a single DART station out here. And after the 2004 Sumatra event, there became a need for that. There's been many, many uh, tsunamis out here, and there have been numerous ones over here too. So finally, there became a need after the significant loss of life of that event to put them there. So you might wonder why are they over here? The absolute most active subduction zone in the world uh, that produces some of the largest earthquakes known to man are right in here along the Nazca plate subducting under South America. Second line would probably be right in here along Alaska and Japan. So those would be my three top places with Indo Indonesia being the fourth of having these severe earthquakes that produce tsunamis. This is what the dark process looks like and how they operate. So what you're seeing at the surface is just a version of just the, the very top of it. And there's more of it at the bottom. The second major type of geologic hazard is a volcanic eruption. These are absolutely devastating in many ways, but no two volcanic eruptions are identical. But there's some commonalities. So you see two radically different types of eruptions occurring in the left. That's Mount St. Helens, the 1980 eruption. That was a Planean, which is a, a name for the type of eruption. Very, very explosive, created a massive pyroclastic cloud. Much more explosive than what you're seeing in Hawaii on the right. So why do they behave differently? It has to do with the thickness of the magmatic or molten material. So the hotter the molten material is, the less time it has to crystallize in the neck, which is the plumbing right here of a volcano. And that directly correlates to how much silica it has. So the higher the silica, think about it as like honey that's crystallized. Silica is gonna make a thicker crystallized honey. When you have less silica, it's gonna be thinner, so it's going to run faster, and that heat keeps it thinner. So the hotter the volcano, the less violent it will erupt. And I'm not in any way saying that it's not dangerous. In its own right, they can be very devastating to human structures because lava flows can travel for tens of miles when they're very hot and fluidy. But the one on the left, if you're anywhere near that, you're in the impact zone, and quite frankly, it would be a miracle if you were able to survive because of the pyroclastic flow and how dangerous they are. So there are a couple of things about volcanoes that are worthy to talk about that are serious hazards. And the first one is volcanic gases. So Hawaii's had a series of months and years where it's just been erupting the actual big island in recent time. And volcanic gases became a big deal on these islands. And so the news coverage of that has elevated people's awareness of how dangerous they are. But when you get something called volcanic smog, we refer to that as bog. And bog is a very dangerous geologic hazard. So you get the sulfur dioxide, which comes out of the volcano. And that's even happening in the caldera. This is in the Hawaii Volcanoes National Monument. So a lot's happened here in the last few years. In fact, the caldera, which this is right here, collapsed and 
back in 2018. This is an active eruption. I would that they had the summit closed here, so you had to stay back at the observation area. But you can see the discoloration, the yellowish stuff back here, that's sulfur dioxide deposits. And there was signage that they were putting up in real time while we were at the park because they were having active eruptions that were creating smog. So very, very dangerous. Another one's lava blows. That's an obvious, but if you take a look at the diagram on the right, you're gonna notice that these are lava blows in the past thousand years on the actual big island of Hawaii. And notice that this area right here is almost solid red because that's where Kilauea, the most active volcano, exists. Now, in the last uh, year or so, from when I'm making this video, we started having Mauna Loa erupt again, which was really exciting from a geologic perspective. Not so good for the people that live in the area. But since these eruptions in Hawaii typically produce much hotter lava, their source of lava and magma from beneath the earth is a very, very deep magma chamber close. It's actually coming out of the mantle. And so it's very, very low in silica, super hot and very fluidy. So when it erupts, it can travel for miles. We call that a flood basalt. Unfortunately, lava flows can create the scenario right here where you not just are getting bog, but you're getting lava flows that are burying communities devastating when this happens because it basically consumes everything in its path. So that is problematic for when humans come in contact with it. Other geologic hazards that people don't think about are something called spatter cones, uh, spatter ramparts. These are the little cones after they solidify, but this is what they look like when they're active. And then these fissures open up and do the same thing as this. And then you can get this is called a spatter rampart, but when it's active, it's called a fissure, and it will produce a lot of unexpected lava eruptions. These fissures can open in, in a roadway or right where houses are and start erupting. The people who lived in Hawaii when these things were happening over the last few years, this was the story. New fissures were opening up on a regular basis, creating an imminent threat to human health and the environment. So the most dangerous geologic hazard for volcanoes is a pyroclastic flow. This occurs when the eruptions are in progress. So we call it a primary risk or hazard. There's something called a secondary. We'll get to that in a minute. But this cooler, thicker lava eruptions that are higher in silica that have more of that crystallized honey type of magma actually stretch the volcano out because that magma is so thick that gases are coming up from underneath and it's just causing that volcano to stretch and to grow. And oftentimes these lava domes, which you're seeing over on the left picture, get so thick one day they actually rupture. It could be because of an earthquake or a landslide on one of them, or they finally just bust right open. And when they do, they produce this type of phenomena where you see these big giant pyroclastic clouds coming down they are moving at such a fast speed that they can reach a community within a minute or two if there's one within that distance of a volcano. Absolutely devastating. A secondary geologic hazard in a volcano is extremely dangerous called a lahar. These are mud flows created by volcanoes. So you're looking at Mount St. Helens. On, these are photos from USGS, and I have been to Mount St. Helens and can tell you that the Lahar deposit is overwhelming in person. But this whole volcano used to be a lot tall. This <clears throat> so you're looking at a Lahar from Mount St. Helens, the 1980 eruption in Washington State. So I want you to look on the left, and I want you to see that big boulder. It doesn't belong there. Typically, lahars, known as mud flows, travel the path of least resistance. So they find roadways, they find river basins, they find things that allow them to travel downhill. And as they reach flatter land, they'll spread out and turn into something called a debris flow. So you're looking at 
the lahar that has solidified. And the lahars are almost like wet concrete. They're very, very hot. When they come through, they can pick up anything, rocks even the size this big and bigger, and start to transport them. So anything in their path can be destroyed. So having been to Mount St. Helens in person, when you get there, it's absolutely overwhelming to see how big the lahar is in person. And then if you travel the highway that goes to Mount St. Helens to the actual monument and uh, to see the summit where you see on the right hand picture, you can see the Lahar and how it impacted the Tootle River Basin, which is the primary river it consumed when it went down, which is right here as well. So when you get an explosive eruption from something like a composite volcano, you're not going to see a lahar typically on a shield volcano or a cinder cone volcano. Cinder cones look like your traditional just shaped conical volcano and shields are very wide like what you would see in Hawaii. Instead, when you see giant volcanoes like the ones you would see in Washington State, uh, Oregon, if you've been to parts of the world that have large volcanoes like the Philippines, those are composites. And when composites erupt, they typically are high in elevation, so they generate a lot of snow and glaciers and ice packs. So they melt when you get those pyroclastic flows, which create the melting of any of these ice packs, which sends all of that stuff down the mountainside in the form of a very dangerous lahar. As I mentioned, as the lahar reaches more flatter ground, it will spread out and turn into a debris flow. And that's a form of mass wasting. And so these pick up everything in its path and they can create this phenomena right here where they literally bury rivers and roadways. You can also have rock falls that occur that are very, very dangerous during a volcanic eruption because oftentimes volcanic eruptions also can have earthquakes that occur as the magmatic material comes to the surface or you get a massive landslide, like in the case of Mount St. Helens, that's, create, that's what cause the actual lava dome to collapse was an earthquake. Another risk that we get are tephra falls. Tephra are any rock deposits of, it, of all sizes that come out of a volcanic eruption. Any eruption can produce tephra. So I want to be very transparent about that. And tephra is classified based on its size. So its diameter size. So if you're looking at fine ash, which is less than two millimeters in diameter, the finer the ash, the actually very dangerous for inhaling and getting in people's lungs. It makes it very hard to breathe. And also the ash can accumulate, like you see in this picture, in such depths if you got this massive eruptions like a pyroclastic flow from a composite uh, erupt or volcano that erupted, you can produce tephra deposits that are tens of uh, feet thick. In some cases, it can bury structures completely. But the weight of ash can actually crush ceilings, can crush uh, cars, and it can uh, be very devastating. And if you get rains with that, then it gets wet and you can continue to have uh, lahars for years to come after the eruption. La Pele, or La Pele, uh, that's pronounced both ways, two millimeters to six millimeters in diameter. La Pele, the bigger it is, obviously, the more dangerous it is. But if you've ever walked around a volcano or a hike to the top, let's say if you went to Sunset Crater in New Mexico or in uh, Arizona, Sunset Crater, you're walking around, it's real crunchy uh, around the top of it. Well, that's all the lapilli that you see there. When you get bigger stuff that's greater than 64 millimeters, there's volcanic blocks and there's their volcanic bombs. And these things are rocks that are being thrusted out of the volcano when it is in an eruption phase. Obviously, during a volcanic eruption, you can get landslides, very, very common. So because volcanoes shake the ground and they produce lots of force, anything that's unstable can collapse during a volcanic eruption. In fact, the magma chamber itself can collapse, and that's known as a caldera. Very, very dangerous, especially if it happens in the ocean. So how do we monitor volcanic hazards? Lots of ways. 
We can do it visually by flyovers and helicopters. We can use cameras that we install. We can use satellite remote sensing where we're looking at changes from outer space to the ground. We can use GIS, Geographic Information System, to actually see ground movement and changes in the size and swelling of an earth of a volcano. We can put seismograph stations to uh, monitor shaking. We can put lahar sensors to measure mud flows. We can use all of these things. The tilt meter is what I was talking about with the shrinking or the expansion of a volcano. So volcanoes like this originally and it starts to grow, that's a pretty good indicator there may be an imminent threat. So there's a much better chance of predicting when a volcano is gonna erupt versus an earthquake uh, situation. So we have monitoring stations that the USGS has where instrumentation and sometimes actually an office has been put for ge uh, geologically active areas. So right now, this is just a snapshot on one day when I was making this presentation, you can see different colored triangles. And the bigger the triangle, the bigger the eruption. Red means there's been a warning. Then you can see like a yellow is an advisory, normal is green. Uh, so if you get a white one, they've been unassigned. It doesn't mean that they're not safe it just or unsafe. It just means they don't have the data to go with it. And then you can see the colors also correspond if you see circles within a time frame of when they happen. So we have lots of USGS right along the Aleutian Islands in Alaska because that's a major subduction zone. This is a major subduction zone. This area right here is along the San Andreas. That's not a subduction, that's a transformed plate boundary. You can see some in Central America, very, very active. That's a subduction zone. Hawaii, she might be able, well, why is there, you know, we know there's volcanoes there. Well, yeah, there's also earthquakes, but these two monitoring systems kind of go hand in hand. All right, so what are the warnings? We do have a warning system in place, primarily for public use because when it's red, that's an imminent threat of a volcanic eruption. The watches are the orange ones. And so the USGS might actually evacuate an area when it gets to somewhere between orange to red. And if there's a, enough data to support that there's an imminent threat to a specific area, they will do their best to evacuate. So the third major type of geologic hazard is mass wasting. Mass wasting includes any type of earth material that moves, that can be very slow, that can be very fast. The most devastating types occur when there's been a rapid uh, or unforeseen type of situation where rock material just moves, like landslides, rock slides, debris flows, rock falls. So this is actually a landslide that occurred in Washington state and absolutely devastating because it totally wiped out a, 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 an area where people lived and it blocked a river there. And so we have a landslide hazards program for USGS that looks at ground stability, that maps it out, that looks at slopes, that looks at other factors like, is it earthquake prone? You know, what type of sediments does it make up? Because the sediments determine how much water can be held in there. All of those factors impact mass wasting. So this is the mapping that's done by USGS for hazards, and that's used by public officials, by building uh, folks, people that are in the business of trying to do city planning to try to mitigate some of the risk of putting people right next to these really high risk areas. You might go, well, most of these are mountain areas. Not all of them, though. You look at in Texas, that's along an escarpment, and that is right where this college is located. So there's a risk for uh, landslides. So anywhere where you get hilly topography, mountainous topography, you get escarpments, you're going to have potential for a lot of landslide types of risk. The only way that we can mitigate these types of mass wasting events is to implement best management practices known as BMPs. And let me be clear that a best management practice is only as good as it's maintained or managed. So you can put up something like the special type of material that's anchoring in a very uh, fragile land, uh, like an escarpment or a uh, mountainside. You can put 
uh, fencing over it, like you see over here, and rock bolts, and even ways to get the water to come out. But you're never going to stop the mass wasting completely. All it does is try to reduce the risk to human health. So a lot of times you're traveling, let me give you an example. You're going through Albuquerque, New Mexico, and there's mountains right there where the Sandia Peak is. And you'll see they put these massive uh, metal fencing along these mountain roadsides that's right where the interstate is, where I-40 is. And it's bolted in to try to make those rocks hold in better. And you'll see where rocks have actually fallen into that rock fence and sometimes onto the highway. But all the fence is doing is trying to reduce those bigger boulders from smashing the cars as they drive by. That's why signage is so important. And I'm going to say that if you haven't been paying attention to your signage when you travel on roadways, maybe that needs to change. That goes also to taking the earbuds out <laughs> because when you see signage like this for the next 12 miles, rock slide avalanche areas, take the music out. Get it to where you can hear and where you're paying attention because signage is there for a reason, typically because an accident like a mass wasting event has already happened. So let's look at some historically significant events. So I'm going to go in chronology, not by type of event. So you're going to kind of move from earthquakes to tsunamis to volcanic eruptions and mass wasting events. So it's, keep in mind, we're just looking at a chronological start from 1906. We can scroll back for thousands of years with historical data from when we've had some very important events, but we're just going to look at some that are significant for what we're talking about today. 1906 Great San Francisco Earthquake, and it's great because it was an 8.3 moment magnitude. We didn't even have moment magnitude developed back then. Richter came a little later, so it's based on the damage and, and movement of the earth and material. But this, these are images from San Francisco, some of them right after the earthquake like this one, the fires in progress and the ground failure in the, two, the end picture here and this middle picture here. But the Pacific plate is sliding along the North American plate. They're sliding against each other. They're not moving up and down. They're moving sideways. And eventually, as they're moving, stress is building up. In one day, they just do this. And that's what happened in 1906. Very dangerous situation. Today's world still would be very dangerous to have the same earthquake in San Francisco. However, most uh, structures have been built to a certain level of code. But if we got another great or rare great event along the San Andreas, that could be devastating. The absolute worst earthquake ever measured, I mentioned earlier, was in 1960 in Chile, South America. Now, I'm going to focus in a couple of really important details here. The focus depth, remember that's where the rupture point happens in an earthquake, was 33 kilometers. That's shallow. That may seem deep, but earthquakes can be measured hundreds of kilometers beneath the Earth's surface. But the magnitude is what's so utterly impressive about this earthquake, and it was a 9.5. The earthquakes shook for more than five minutes at a 9.5. That's almost incomprehensible. So you're looking at a subduction zone right along that west coast of South America, and basically it ruptured for hundreds of kilometers, and it did what we call sideways and upward movement. So along that entire hundreds of kilometers subduction zone fault line, the whole earth moved sideways and pushed upwards along that, creating massive tsunami waves, which traveled all the way to Hawaii, to Japan, Alaska, wrecking havoc along its area, not to mention in Chile itself. In 1964, just four years later, we would have the largest earthquake that's happened in the United States called the Good Friday Alaskan Earthquake. And it's called that because it was on Good Friday, which is important because schools and government buildings were shut down for the holiday. Had it not been anything but a holiday, a lot more people probably would have perished. So don't get me wrong, people did perish and not just in Alaska. They like Hawaii and because tsunami waves went all throughout the Pacific Ocean Basin and Hawaii was deeply impacted by this event. 
but the ground failure was significant. There was subsidence. There was, uh, this is actually kind of right in the downtown district. I've been here. We went to Alaska and stayed in the city before a cruise. And this has been rebuilt. There's now a hotel here. and We stayed there. And so the road actually does this right where this happened. Right near here is where a bunch of the houses were impacted by the tsunami. And you can still see the tree lines where there's mud on there all these decades later. And now it's a big giant city park because all of those structures were destroyed and people uh, perished. So they put a memorial there. This is actually uh, a school building. So when you start to think about this, look at the focus depth. It's 25 kilometers and a magnitude of 9.2. And it shook for about the same amount of time that the Chile earthquake did. This happened in the, the Valdez area. So you're looking at sideways upward movement, pushing up that ocean, creating massive tsunami waves in all direction, and then actually ground failure in a serious way just from the earthquake. But you add a tsunami wave in there and it's a series of them and it creates devastation. So another very important eruption geologically is super significant, which is the 1980. Mount St. Helens eruption. And here's why. This is what she looked like the day before her eruption. This is what she looked like after the eruption. So she lost about a third of her vertical height. And you, what you see right here is the lava dome punching out. Now you see a new lava dome right in here. What happened was the lava dome collapsed because of an earthquake, released a pyroclastic flow that came out sideways, which is called a lateral eruption and produce a massive set of lahars and pyroclastic flow. So this was a terrible thing, but one of the important geologic advances that came from it was that we saw a lateral eruption and got it on film. Geologists actually saw it happen. So now we take that same information and we can apply that elsewhere with the same types of volcanoes and help save lives. This is my shot of Mount St. Helens from the uh, visitor center at uh, the David Johnston Observatory, which is the GOSGS employee who was killed. He was on this side of the mountain uh, monitoring it, and they never expected that it would come out this way. They thought it would go just straight up, and so it was a very big learning curve. So he and other people lost their life that day, but he was the USGS employee that perished in the eruption, and he died in the pyroclastic flow. There's no doubt he didn't stand a chance because it this used to be a giant forest right here. And when you get there, there are trees that have been snapped off and they're buried in the ash. Side note, that would be a great place to make petrified wood down the line. But this eruption is so significant because what we learn scientifically from it has helped save lives across the world. In 1991, the largest eruption in the last hundred years has occurred on the planet at Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines. And this volcanic eruption had multiple precursor eruptions and the big giant one that happened uh, in just literally, this is not the giant eruption. This is one that happened a few days before. It was so large that there's a volcanic explosivity index scale called VEI. It is so huge that it is in the colossal uh, realm which is bigger than Mount St. Helens, producing an enormous amount of ash. This plane literally was bulging downward because of the weight of the ash. So bad deal. In 2004, we had one of the worst geologic events happen on the planet. The day after Christmas, first thing in the morning as people in Indonesia were getting up to go to work, maybe do their after holiday shopping, and we would have a rare great earthquake that shook for about 10 minutes, 10 minutes at a 9.1 magnitude, sending tsunami waves literally straight into Indonesia. They had no time. There was no warning system. So the Indian plate is the continental plate and a small little oceanic plate called the Burma plate was uh, subducting underneath it. And it created a massive set of earthquake and tsunamis, and it wiped out entire communities, not just in Indonesia, Thailand, India, 
you name it, there are a number of places that were impacted by this particular area of massive tsunami waves. So this is a case study of why a warning system is so important and also the reason why a warning system has been put in the Indian Ocean Basin. In 2011, the Japan earthquake, and it has a formal name, but we'll just give it its common name, Japan earthquake slash tsunami occurred. And this area, Japan has tsunamis on a regular basis and earthquakes. It's in the ring of fire in the Pacific plate. It's on an active subduction zone. But this one was different. You also know that there was a nuclear plant that had failure. So that's part of the story. But let's not even talk about that. Let's talk about just the earthquake and tsunami itself. This is the kind of damage that it does. So you had a 30 kilometer focus and a 9.1 rare grade earthquake that created this massive sideways and upward pushing of the ocean water, creating a tsunami that impacted all of the um, ocean basin and certainly Japan. So when you're looking at this type of event, they're so incredibly rare, but they're highly destructive and they're the ones why we want warning systems in place. In 2014, the Oso landslide, this is in Washington state, gives you a perspective of what it looks like. And there was a township down here and it was just completely buried. So it killed some people and buried these, these homes. And so this was a landslide. This wasn't caused by an earthquake. It wasn't caused by a volcanic eruption. It was basic mass wasting. And these things can happen unexpectedly. And when they do, they cause devastation to human life and property. In 2015, the Nepal earthquake, very famous for uh, killing some hikers on Mount Sa uh, on <clears throat> In 2015, the Nepal earthquake happened. Uh, this is where the Himalayas or Mount Everest is. It's not very far from there. And hikers died on Mount Everest from avalanches. That's just part of the story. The actual earthquake impact of very metropolitan urban areas as well as you see right here. So you can see where the buildings just kind of went sideways and collapsed. And this was a 7.8 magnitude. The difference here is you've got two continents colliding. So it's not a subduction zone. Had a 30 kilometer focus and basically buried people alive in, in rubble. Some of them actually from mass wasting, which we'll get to now. So uh, Leng Tang Valley is an example, right? This is an actual trekking point for people who are trekking to Mount Everest. So they have to hike a distance, they're kind of fly into a distance, hike a distance, and then they go to the different levels of camps for their trek up to the top of Mount Everest. This is before the earthquake, and this is after the earthquake. And it buried a village killing over 200, well, it shows you how many people, 243 people. It wasn't just the people who lived there. There were tourists that were there to go to Mount uh, Everest. And then there were the workers that were local tourism that were not from the area, but all these people died. So we're thinking about that Nepal earthquake and you're looking at a town that was just completely buried. The valley was buried from a landslide related to rapid shaking of an earthquake. So that's one of the things I'm wanting to point out is typically one natural disaster like this earthquake or volcanic eruption can produce more than one geologic hazard at the same time, causing multiple dangers to human health in the environment. In 2018, we had devastating uh, eruptions in Kilauea that were not necessarily explosive, several were, but most of them were just very hot and fluidy and traveled for tens of kilometers away from the source. And what was so crazy about this is that fissures would open up and then long cracks in the earth in Hawaii would just start producing these lava eruptions that would last for days, burying entire subdivisions, actually expanding the size of the island. It buried over a hundred homes, creating massive destruction of property. Most of most people were fairly safe because they were evacuated in time because these weren't highly explosive eruptions, but the air quality was very bad. And then the ultimate destruction of property was uh, totally devastating. In 2023, there was a 
earthquake in Turkey that basically leveled certain towns and cities. It was a 7.8 magnitude with a focus depth of 10 kilometers. I think that is important to show that shallow focus and big magnitude don't go well together, especially in highly populated areas like this one. This is a complex situation where you have two continental plates smashing together. You've got a subduction zone and another set of plates nearby. You've got a lot of stuff going on. So you've got lots of compression of the plates, a lot of stress built up there where the plates are smashing together. And this creates massive faulting that sometimes just slips. And when it does, it creates this kind of havoc. It's no surprise that there's going to be earthquakes there, but it's truly devastating for humans when it does. In 2023, Morocco had an earthquake and this was a 6.8 magnitude earthquake. So on the day that I'm recording this, this is a very recent event. The focus depth was 26 kilometers deep and it was in the Atlas Mountains where Eurasia and Africa are smashing together. So no surprise that as two continental plates are smashing, you're gonna get lots of vaulting and uplift, making this a gorgeous place, a very highly visited tourist area. In fact, this, some of the structures that were just lost and destroyed were protected as World Heritage Sites. So very sad thing, but most of these things that, like these structures you see here, were not built to withstand this type of earthquake. They're many of them built out of clay materials and brick and things that would not withstand this type of shaking. So you can imagine the impacts and the devastation that corresponds to an event like this, which is why any kind of mitigation process and planning is important as you're living on areas that are mountainous like this. They're beautiful, but they living in places like this have risk. So you can see the epicenter of the Moroccan earthquake and you can see the intensity of severity of shaking. And that's right along those Atlas Mountains where you saw those hillsides and those just collapsed structures everywhere. These people were caught off guard and the shaking happened. It's not like earthquakes don't happen in Morocco, they do. But unfortunately, this is the one, worst one in decades, many decades, like six or so er, uh, decades. And with it comes loss of life and property. So applying what you know, the whole point of teaching you and sharing these situations, these hazards, is so you know what to look for. When you move, you travel, you go places, you should consider the geologic hazards before you take a job somewhere. You should look at the meteorological hazards. They all are important. This is in Rocky Mountain National Park. And this is actually the site of a massive uh, flood deposit. And this is what's left. And so you get there, this is called Alluvial Fan, by the way, it's the, the name of the place in the park. This happened unexpectedly and the flood wiped out a big section all the way down the river basin, the big Thompson River Basin, but this is actually in the park. So it could be clues. I mean, you got a mountain range just like this, beautiful, gorgeous. So if you get a flood situation, a lot of rain, a lot of snow melt, this could be a problem and not to mention just mass wasting of rock slides, rock falls and landslides. If we had an earthquake, can you imagine? If you had an active volcano here, you can, kind of do the thoughts of, oh my goodness, this would be a very dangerous place to be. This is Mount St. Helens. These are the trees I was talking about. You see something like this. People didn't come over and cut these trees off. They were snapped off. And you would see the trees. They're uh, buried in the ash deposits here. While this is beautiful to look at right here, it's scary to think about the impact and the devastation. There used to be a giant forest sitting here. And they've replanted a lot of forest in the impact zone to try to get it back to where it was, but it'll take decades. So if Mount St. Helens were to erupt again or a volcano like it in the area like Mount Rainier, those are all very high risk areas. That's why we have earthquake and volcano monitoring systems out there working 24 seven. This is a highway right near Hatch, New Mexico. And there's signage there. When you get up to this hillside, there are rocks all on the roadside along here because there's daily <laughs> problems with mass wasting. So you see this signage, that should be important for you to pay attention. 
we took a cruise to Alaska and we pulled into Sitka. That's where we are right here. And I was just floored that our boat pulled up and that's what we saw right outside our cabin uh, veranda. And I was like, ooh, uh, evidence of mass wasting. So let's kind of apply what you've learned here. So you get landslides, you can see the land has just fallen, but think about massive rocks material and landslide ending up right here in the fjord, which is a an embayment, uh, a glacial embayment. This is a port for major cruise ships and there's a city right there called Sitka. Imagine if this created a tsunami, what that could do. Imagine if you got a landslide that landed on these cruise boats. It's bound to happen because you can see this is a, an active system going on right there. So thinking about all you've learned, apply what you know. Think about the geologic hazards where you live, where you travel. Pay attention to the signage. Learn what best management practices are and if they're being deployed and maintained in an area where you live or where you're gonna move. Because these things are important to protecting your family, your property, and your livelihood. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next stop, which will be lectures over a different topic in our science.